My name is Jose Nieves, and I'm running for Queens County District Attorney. I'm here at the Core and Solid in Jamaica, Queens, uh, hosting a meet and greet for the Queens voters so they can get to know who I am. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. All right. Today, it gives me great pleasure to introduce to you Jose Nieves. But before I do that, let me give you a little history about Jose. Jose grew up in East New York, Brooklyn, in a single parent home with six siblings. His life of service dates back more than 25 years when he served as a peer mediator in the Queens Mediation Center in Queens, Jamaica, and served as a leadership development specialist with Aspira, a national Hispanic organization that's dedicated to developing young leaders in the Latino community. Jose dedicated his life to public service he fought for this country in Afghanistan as a captain in the United States Army. Jose had been a strong advocate for our justice in the city and state. And he will fight to protect us as residents and family as Queens DA. So with further ado, welcome Mr. Jose Nieves. Excellent job, excellent job. Thank you all for coming, thank you all for being here. My name is Jose Nieves and I'm running for Queens County District Attorney. I've been a progressive prosecutor for over 18 years, having worked with the New York State Attorney General's Office, the U.S. Attorney General's Office, the Brooklyn District Attorney's Office, and the U.S. Army as a military prosecutor. I'm a proud Army combat veteran who served our country in the Army for 10 years and one year in Afghanistan. And I'm a community leader. I've been a community leader for over 25 years. I've served the community as the chairman of the Veterans of Foreign Wars um, com Committee on, uh, on local posts in Queens. I also served as the PTA president of my children's school. I also served as the youth director of my church and also the flag football coach for my kids' uh, flag football team. So I've always been in the community. I've always been giving back to the community, especially the youth of our community, because I've always believed that the youth are our future and we have to all look out for our young people. And it doesn't matter if, if they're your child or if they're somebody else's child. You, you are a father to your children, but you're a father figure to other children. And that's how we all have to look our, at ourselves. And I'm happy to be here with my wife, uh, Vivian, and my daughter, Christina, uh, who, do, who are always supporting me. And for the last 20 years, I lived with my wife and my kids in Southeast Queens. Um, but before that, I grew up in East New York, Brooklyn, one of the toughest neighborhoods in the city in the 80s and 90s during the height of the crack epidemic. So I saw why violent crime is, uh, you know, public safety is so important. And I saw violent crime in the streets. I saw violent crime tear apart families and communities. So I understand why it's necessary to have public safety. But as a man of color, as a Latino, I also saw the discrimination in our criminal justice system because I myself was stopped by the police because of the color of my skin. And 25 years ago, I made a decision to be a member of law enforcement because of a stop and frisk that I, that I experienced. 25 years ago, I was walking on Jamaica Avenue from a gym going home. And I, 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 you know, I, was, I was in my regular clothes. I was about 16 years old. And a blue and white car pulled up to the, to the sidewalk. Two cops jumped out and they were like, you know, we have to talk to you. Now, I have been stopped by the police before, so I knew the drill. You say, yes, sir, no, sir. You keep your hands out and open in front of you, and you do what they say. And that's exactly what happened. And, uh, but, they, but they didn't let me go, and I was confused why they weren't going to let me go. They said, put your hands on the car. We just need to hold you here for a second. And I waited, and I waited until I saw an unmarked car rolling down Jamaica Avenue. And then I realized this wasn't a stop and frisk. This was something else. And the, and the unmarked car is parked right next to me, right parallel to where we were. And they were like, look over to, to, to the car. And I looked over to the car, and my, ha my heart sank because I realized that the, the, tra the trajectory of my life at that moment could have changed forever. It could have changed forever as, as it did for semi, so many of, of my friends and family members when one day the police pick you up. And then all of a sudden, you're in a system that you have not, you have no knowledge of. You're in a criminal justice system that treats you like, uh, you know, some, you know, like you're already guilty as of having a presumption of innocence. So for me, after that experience, thank God nothing happened. Thank God at at the end of that, ex, you know, experience, they, the officer said you're free to go, and the car drove away. But when I got home and I spoke to my brother, 
I told him, I said, you know, this is this is really unfair. This is this is not justice. This is this is discrimination. And he said, you can do two things. You can mouth off at the police and get yourself arrested and ruin your life forever, or you can change the system. You can do something with your life, and you can change the system and make it better for your family, for your community, make it better for the, your, your neighborhood. So that's what I did. I went on to St. John's University where I, started, where I studied criminal justice. And when there I realized it wasn't the police that had power. It was the prosecutors, the defense counsels, the judges. They're the ones who controlled the criminal justice system. They're the ones who held people in jail pending trial. They're the ones who decided who was gonna, who was gonna let go, who, was, who were they gonna let go and who were they gonna prosecute? Who were they gonna treat fairly and who were they not? So that's for me was so important to learn early on because what I decided to do is go to law school. And right after law school, well, right while I was in law school, I had the opportunity to work for the New York State Attorney General's Office, the Civil Rights Bureau, and we did an investigation into the NYPD. It was the first of its kind. And we learned and we proved through empirical data that the NYPD was stopping people of color at an 8 to 1 ratio. 8 to 1. That means it wasn't even close. They were stopping it. For every 8 people of color, they stopped one Caucasian. And from, from, from our perspective, it was now the New York State Attorney General saying that NYPD was engaged in racial profiling. The NYPD was engaged in discrimination. So from that point on, I realized how powerful an attorney can be on sp uh, putting a spotlight on discrimination in our criminal justice system, on showing how we can change our system. And based on that case, we changed the system of how the NYPD actually does business. And after that, I went on to become a district attorney in Brooklyn where I did criminal cases, violent cases, but I also did justice in that I took individuals who were caught up in the criminal justice system, and I gave them a second chance. Because for me, a prosecutor is a minister of justice. They're a minister of justice, and they should be doing justice in every case. And sometimes justice is giving somebody a second chance. Somebody, sometimes justice is making sure you give somebody help when they're down. When somebody's getting caught up in a criminal justice system because they're a drug addict, because they have mental illness, because they're a combat veteran coming back from, from, from Afghanistan or Iraq and they have PTSD, or they're a domestic violence survivor and they've been traumatized for their entire life because the family that they know, the only family that they knew abused them, you have to look at those circumstances and give that person an opportunity to change their life around. Give them the services they need to change their life around. And that's how you save lives as a district attorney. That's how you become a minister of justice. And after 11 years, after 11 years of being a, a prosecutor, I changed my, my position because I wanted to start holding the system accountable. So I started prosecuting correction officers for excessive force. Individuals who had a badge and a shield and, and a uniform and they would abuse their authority. They would beat individuals up, incarcerated at Rikers Island to the point of almost an inch of their life. Almost an inch of their life. And I prosecuted those individuals because no one should be subjected to that type of uh, discrimination, that type of violence. And I prosecuted the correction officers and made sure we held them accountable. And then in 2015, the governor signed an order after Eric Garner. After Eric Garner, the governor found that the district attorneys in local, in local counties like Queens and, and Staten Island and, and throughout the state of New York, they had a conflict of interest. They were not prosecuting the police the way they should have been. And then Eric Garner was an example of that. So what we did was the governor signed an executive order designating a special prosecutor, and he tapped me to be that special prosecutor. So I was a special prosecutor charged with investigating and prosecuting police officers who killed unarmed civilians. And I did that for the entire state of New York, from Albany down to Long Island. And I prosecuted the first case against a man, a police officer who killed a man in front of his family by shooting him three times while he was unarmed. And I brought justice to that family. And in the end of the day, that family knew that the system worked. The system worked. That's what I'm about. That's what I'm about. That's why I'm running for Queens District Attorney, because I have the professional experience to make the change happen. But more importantly, I have the life experience 
to change the criminal justice, to motivate me to change the criminal justice system. That's why I have the conviction to run. That's why I want to give the, the, the Queens residents and the residents of Queens an opportunity to pick somebody who's qualified and experienced and has done public, public safety and has done criminal justice reform because we have a broken criminal justice system, but you have to trust the person to, 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 to actually change it. And how do you trust the person to change it? You trust the person to change it when they know that what the problems are, when they themselves experience the discrimination of the system. That's how you know they'll change it because it's not about uh, reading a book for them. It's not about listening to a, a, another person tell, tell them what the problems are. It's not about reading uh, you know, a hearing. It's about I know from my life experience why the system has to change. I've seen my family incarcerated under the Rockefeller drug laws. I've seen my friends that I grew up with, you know, subjected to the criminal justice system and ruined their entire life. That's why I want to change this criminal justice system. That's why I want to divert people from away from the criminal justice system when you can, whenever you have an opportunity, but at the same time protect our communities, protect our families because we don't want to see violent crime in our streets. You know, they they, they look at Southeast Queens and sometimes they say, well, Southeast Queens is a hard neighborhood to, to live in. And, you know, they, they just have to live with that. No, it's not true. You know, we, we, in Southeast Queens, we care about our community. We care about our property. We care about our kids. And we want a better life for ourselves and our families. We don't want to see violent crime. We don't want to see gangs picking our kids up off the street and, and misleading them and, and leading them into the criminal justice system where they're being, you know, abused or, or mistreated. We don't want to see our drug dealers in our, in our neighborhood. We don't want to see violent crime, you know, threatening our kids. And I have two kids. My daughter is here. She's 17. My son is 14. They take this, you know, I have skin in the game. They take the bus to school every day. So I have to make sure that they're, you know, safe. And every, and the thousands of kids that go to school and come back from school are safe. Because that's what we want in Southeast Queens. And so it's not a matter of saying, oh, we want to give everybody a pass. It's not. We want to protect our, our communities, but we want a fair and just system. We want everybody treated equally. We want the police to police our communities as they do other communities. You know, it shouldn't be different based on the zip code that you live in. And that's what I'm about. I'm about bringing that change and making sure that DA's office is diverse from the top down. And it takes the person on the top to make sure that's the case. So on June 25th, I'm asking you to come out and vote. On June 25th, I'm asking you to come out and vote for me because I'm the candidate who brings the experience of a prosecutor but the life experience of somebody who's, who's committed to changing the criminal justice system. And in the end of the day, that's the type of balance you want. And I want you to vote for me on June 25th. Thank you very much. I'll be, entertain, I'll be entertaining any questions that you have, you know, any questions that you want, or issues that you want to raise, criminal justice issues that you want to raise. Um, you know, I'll be more than happy to, to, to answer those questions either privately or, or, or right now while I'm in front. Um, because these, these are serious, serious issues, issues, you know, and, and I'll, I'm, I'm in every community. community. Yes. yes. Mr. Nieves, uh, all four boroughs other than Queens has a criminal conviction review in it. Right. Richard Brown for the last 20 years did not allow anybody to set up that conviction review unit. If you get elected as a Queen's District Attorney, are you going to promise us that you are going to set up a conviction review unit, number one? And number two, are you going to promise that you are going to replace each and every single individual of those who are working under Richard Brown? And third is, can you put it, as a District Attorney, I know you are not going to be a legislator, you cannot invent a law. But is there a way you are going to support a term limit for the Queen's District Attorney too? Because yeah. they cannot run for 30, 40 years right. and know there is no accountability in them uh, at that office. Right. Can you promise this three things? So, so what I can do is I, I can definitely promise you that I'm going to do a conviction review in it. And my conviction review unit is going to be different from the other candidates. This is how it's different. I'm going to have an advisory council for that unit and for me. And the advisory council is going to be made up of criminal justice advocate uh, agencies, like the Justice Center, like the Innocence Project, like the, um, the Brennan um, Criminal Justice uh, you know, Institute. And, and those centers have been doing 
wrongful conviction um, exonerations for years. They've been seeing the, the wrong and discrimination in the system. And it's so important to include them, but I'm also going to include those individuals who have been convicted, wrongfully convicted and exonerated. Why is that? Because they themselves felt the discrimination of the criminal justice system. They themselves seen how the system failed and convicted an innocent man and allowed a perpetrator to be in the streets uh, doing God knows what. So that's why that conviction review unit is going to be very strong and it's going to have an independent advisory council. It's also very important that we have term limits. <coughs> Because we, we haven't, haven't voted, voted a, a, a new, new district, district attorney, attorney in over 42 years. Wow. Wow. Yeah. 42 yeah. years yeah. we have yeah. not yeah. voted a new district, district attorney. attorney. The last <laughs> district attorney <laughs> served for 28 years. Wow. And, and this, this is our once-in-a-lifetime once opportunity to change the criminal justice system. system. To, to make sure that, that the person who's there represents our interests. And, and if, if we give them, if we give them this opportunity, we'll never see it again in our generation. And, and that's, that's why it's so important that we, we vote, vote to the, on June 25th. So, so that's, that's why we need term, term limits. Because we can't have an individual holding on to the criminal justice system for 28 years and, and doing the same policy. Because when, when he was... When, 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 this, when Mr. Brown was elected the first time, when he was actually he wasn't elected, he was appointed by the governor at the first time. And he was 91. It was the height of the war on crime. There was high crime in every borough. There was uh, drug, high drug activity in every, we had the Rockefeller drug laws. He came in a time where law and order had to be, for, from his perspective, about punishment, about incarceration. Now we know, now we know that incar you can't incarcerate your problems. You can't incarcerate the, the problem of drug addiction. You can't incarcerate the problem of mental illness. It doesn't help the problem. And that's why I'm a strong believer in making sure we address the, the driver of the misconduct. And as district attorney, I'm not going to be in for 28 years. I, I, I promise that I won't serve more than three terms. And I, and I think three terms is more than enough, which is a, each term is four years. Each term is four years. And e three terms is more than enough for me to do my change and to, to have my legacy of changing the criminal justice system and then allowing somebody to come in and take a fresh look at the criminal justice system. See what's wrong, see how they can take it and change it and make it better. Uh, because I don't think somebody should be there for 28 years. I, there's no reason for it and, and it doesn't help, it doesn't serve the community. You know, you know and, 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 and the, the second, second question you had was, was the, what was the second, second question? question? Second question, but this is the most important one. Right. Right. That the important one is, Change Change in that part, yeah. Yeah. how to deal with the Richard, uh, uh, old district attorney Richard Brown, that if she's going to get elected, she's not going to replace nobody. Right. It would be the same thing that way Queen district attorney was running for the last 28 years. Right. Right. Can you promise me if you are going to get elected, you are going to replace or do 110% reform right. of that office? Yeah, yeah. We, we need to, to change out the entire executive staff of the district attorney's office. This is why. Because they've been trained and they've been working for decades under the same policy. And when I come in, I, I'm not going to uh, adopt that policy. I have a different vision for the office. I have a different policy. And my policy is about diverting people from the criminal justice system. It's about ending cash bail. It's about having the conviction review unit. It's about being ministers of justice and not being a rubber stamp for the NYPD. Being a, a minister of justice where we check what they do. We're a check on them. And when they come in with a case, we scrutinize the case to see if it's something that's based on real evidence or it's something that's other than real evidence. And it's something that they've generated or created based on whatever they're doing. Okay? And that's what we have to do as a district attorney. You know? And, and, and in order for me to do that successful as a district attorney, I have to have a, a whole new um, executive staff. And I actually have to have not only a new executive staff, but also new assistant district attorneys and things like that. Because they have to buy into the, to the vision. And the vision is for justice. And the vision is for doing the right thing the right way every case. You know, and that's why I would replace the executive staff. And I would make sure that I diversify the, the DA's office so that it looks like this room. That's what it has to look like. It has to look like this room because this is the room that represents the community. And if we're going to serve the community, we have to look like the community. We have to understand the community. We have to speak the community's language. And, and the only way to do that is to diversify the Queens District Attorney's Office. And this is true, you know, and you have to understand that 
you know, this, this election has machines on one end and machines on the other. You have, on one end, you have the Democratic County machine pushing one candidate who has no experience whatsoever having investigated or prosecuted a case, who was the borough president for how many years, an assembly one before that, but she was never in law enforcement. And she says she doesn't, she doesn't need that experience. And she says she doesn't need experience. I, I, I disagree with her. Because the DA's office, a district attorney is going to make very critical decisions on life and death cases, on cases where you have serious crimes. And then on the other end, we have the, the Socialists of America push, machine pushing another candidate. And the candidate they, they're pushing has six years' experience as a defense counsel. So on, on both ends, but on both extremes, you have the, the, the county machine pushing nobody with experience. You have the socialist pushing somebody with no experience. And why is that? Ask yourself, why are the, 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 the democratic and the, and the socialist machines pushing people with no experience? It's because they want to control them. It's because that's how they control them. If they don't have the experience, they can't stand up for themselves and say, no, that's not happening on my watch. That's not gonna be that's not gonna be the case in my under my administration. And that's why they're doing it. They need somebody they can control. And when you have a prosecutor who's been doing this for 18 years, I know the law. I know what the DA's office can and cannot do. And I will let not let anyone outside of the DA's office, any politician or you know, public figure tell me whether a case should be prosecuted or not. The only person that I'm answerable to as district attorney is the community. And that's who I'll be answerable to. And every decision that I make will, will be the, the, my, the, the, the person, person that tells tell me whether I'm right or wrong will be the community. community. And, and that's, that's how, how I'm going to do it. Yes, yes, sir. All the way in the back. Good afternoon, Mr. Josie. I'm Lion Nata, Kevin. Thank you for coming. On this note, as the guy was speaking on things like the exoneration. Yes. As we here in New York City can see that marijuana is being decriminalized at yes, the moment. Right. Yeah, slowly by story, we would like to know if you are one of those who are gonna help to exonerate a lot of the young kids that was charged for marijuana and it's messing up their record, they can't get a job. I can't move forward in the future to better Absolutely. their life. And that mostly And, and I think you're right. It, it's we we you know our experience in in our communities is dead on right. You know when you say you know they're 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 over policing our communities and they're charging us with these low level offenses and they're not charging other communities with the same offenses. That's true, because there was a study that just came out. They they reported yesterday, I think, or this earlier this week, seventy over seventy percent of the marijuana arrests were African American and Latino, black and brown people. Over 70%. Clearly, they're targeting our community for these arrests. Clearly. So what I'm going to do is, one, I'm going to decline to prosecute. Because if you don't prosecute it, they can't arrest you on it. All right? Two, I'm going to make sure we, exoner we, we expunge the convictions of all these prior um, individuals who have these convictions. But it's not just about that. But I will not only expunge the possession of marijuana convictions, I will also expunge the fair beat convictions, the conv convictions for uh, being in the dark, in, being in the park after dark, loitering, tr uh, simple trespass. You know, these are all convictions, you know, the worst of all, o OGA, uh, you know, obstruction of governmental administration, which they always charge, resisting arrest, which they always charge. Because these convictions are not based on public safety. These convictions are based on criminalizing black and brown communities. That's what they're about. And, then what, what, and it's been going on for generations. And for generations, are, and it's usually young black men, young brown men, who are saddled with these convictions. And now they can't have a job. They can't get a license to be a barber. They can't get a housing in a public housing. They can't get any. They can't get a student loan to go to, to go to college. They're banned. They become an outcast of society, and then they they, they feel feel de feel desperate because society has turned their backs on them, and that's not justice. 
that's not justice. That is that that is not promoting public safety. That's endangering people's lives. That's what that is. And and, and as district attorney, not only will I expunge those marijuana arrests, but the other uh, low level offenses that I feel have been systematically used to criminalize our communities. Thank you for the question. If you have any other questions, let me yes, ma'am. But you said when you were younger, you would stop to search, right? Stop and frisk, whatever. Yeah. Being that the gun crime over here is really bad, particularly in the summer, what are your feelings about stop and frisk now? Don't you think it's necessary? To no. No, I, because they're not using it as a police tool. They're using it as a discriminatory tool. So, you know, and, and we've had people, police officers, go on the stand. Go on the stand and say, I stopped. 50 to 75 people a day, a day. And, and the judge asked the, the officer, why, why do you stop so many people? Well, you know, if they adjust their weight, if they adjust their, 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 their belt, I, I'll stop them. If they have baggy clothes, I'll stop them. And, and everything he said, the judge was like, you know what? That's consistent with people of color, you know, communities of color. So basically you're stopping everybody in, in these communities. And they think it's necessary. That's that, you know, back then, well, even sometimes even now, they, they think that's the way they're going to get to the root of crime, gun violence. And that's not how you do it. Because you partner with the community. The community knows who are the bad actors in the community. The community knows who are the ones that are pushing drugs and are, are, are recruiting young people to, to, you know, to do violence, to gang to gangs and stuff like that. They know. So you partner with the community because this, I'm going to stop every third person, is not working. All you're doing is you're alienating the community that you should be partnering with. Because when I got stopped, I got to tell you, when I got stopped as a young man, the last thing I wanted to do was help the police. The last thing I wanted to do was go up to the police. And I, I, I'll be honest with you, I've seen homicides go down. People shot feet for me. I may have called 911, but you think I waited for the police? Nope. Because I didn't want to be put in a lineup, right? I didn't want nobody to look at me, right? Because that's how you feel when you're in a situation where the police are constantly stopping you and putting you in a position that you feel like you've done something wrong. You, the last thing you want to do is, come, come, even if you're lost, the last thing you want to do is come up to a police officer and ask for a direction. Because you don't know what's in their mind. You don't know if they're a good person or a bad. You don't know if they're going to treat you well or not. So you stay away. And that's a sad. That's sad because the police need the community. They need the community. That's how they are effective. The community tells the police where the problems are, who are the problems uh, individuals are, where the drugs are being pushed, where the gangs are, are recruiting kids. And, and in order to do that, you have to have that relationship. And you can't have that relationship while stopping people every, every third day. You can't have it. That's why stop and frisk has been, you know, it's been overused and abused. You know, there's always a tool, right? It could be one tool in your in your arsenal, in your toolbox. But when you take it to a point where people just feel like you're doing it because of the color of their skin, because of where they live, then you lose the effectiveness of that tool. tool. Yes, sir. Um, I was thinking about the, uh, that that kind of quota that police Quotas. have right to you know, carry on arrest. Yes. Would that then kind of uh, get in the middle of, of this whole saying, uh, things? Is that then that getting in the middle of the whole thing, say, if you want for me to communicate with the community, right? Yeah, absolutely. But then what happened? They have some kind of quota to have the rest done during the border. Right. I'm thinking that could be a kind of problem. That's a huge problem because it's, 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 it's right in the middle of the whole thing. Yeah. So you want the police to communicate with the, with, with, with the community, but at the same time, if nothing happens and everything is fine, then they in trouble. They, they need to have a rest done. So, right. You understand my point? Oh, I you know, quotas, arrest quotas, summons quotas, any type of quota is is bad policy. Why? Because now you're encouraging somebody to do something, not because of the facts of the case, not because of what they saw, but because they feel have to. They get to a number. They have to get to a number. 
So that's why officers are saying, I'm going to stop 50 to 70 people a day. Because between those 50 and 70 people a day, I can get maybe three or four arrests, five arrests. Somebody's got to have something, whether it be marijuana, uh, a knife, uh, a gun, something. I can, I'm going to catch somebody with something. You know, and, and, and it's the wrong it's the wrong approach. It's the wrong approach. But that's why you have to have a district attorney that's a minister of justice. Because if you have a district attorney who believes and, and, and is, is, is changing the culture of the district attorney's office to being doing the justice in every case, then when the police come to the to, to the DA's office and we scrutinize those cases and we ask them, Well, why did you stop that young man? and they can't give us articulable facts and reasons why they did it, there's a problem. And that case shouldn't be processed because the police are not doing what they're doing, you know, what they're supposed to be doing. They're violating the individual's rights to try to get to a number. And, and, and the, 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 the DA's office, as the chief law enforcement officer of the entire county, has to set the standard, has to set the culture. And if the culture is, I'm not going to accept that, I'm not going to tolerate that. And if you come in and you lie on the, 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 the witness stand or you submit a false report to cover it up, I'm going to prosecute you. You're going to be on the hot seat. You're going to be the one pres- that, that we're going to be filing charges on because we have to hold the police as accountable as we do everybody else in society because the police cannot be held above the law or below the law. They, they have to be subjected to the law just like everybody else. And that's how we deal with it. That's how we deal with it. You change the culture. Right now, the culture in the DA's office is whatever they do, we'll go along with. It's a go along to get along philosophy. Whatever the police say that you know they want to do, we'll go along with it. And that's what. And, and that's a dangerous situation because that means there's nobody watching the police. Nobody's being a, a check on the police. And that, and that's why they'll abuse that. They'll abuse that because they know that the DA is. Wink and a nod in their favor. They, we understand each other, and that's not good. There has to be a separation. There has to be a check on one on the other. And as the chief law enforcement officer, you have to be that check. So that's why we, we would change the culture, and we will make sure that we hold the officers accountable for doing stops illegally. For, for just stopping people because they're driving while black. It's just stopping people because they're, you know, of color and they're walking on the street at 2 o'clock in the morning. That's not a reason to stop somebody, you know. And, that, and, and, and you, have to, you have to address that. But that also doesn't mean that we, we let violent crime go unchecked either. We have to go after the violent crime. I want to focus the, the district attorney's resources on specifically to do long-term investigations into drug um, enterprises, gangs, to make sure we have human trafficking rings broken up, to make sure we have um, you know, long-term you know, investigations to break up those individuals who are disrupting our communities and endangering our communities uh, and affecting public safety. We still have to do that, and we are supposed to do that because as DA, I'm the, I'm the chief law enforcement officer. I'm the one in charge of public safety and public safety, and it takes somebody who's done it before. And that's why it's so important that you have to look. When you, when you, go, to, when you go to vote today or when you go to vote on June 25th, you should ask yourself three questions. Who has the experience? Who's done the job before? Who knows what they're doing? Who's led before? And who's, gonna com- who's committed to changing the criminal justice system? You know I'm committed because I explained that to you. I have 18 years' experience doing this. I have the experience. I know what I'm doing. But how do you know I'm going to lead? Because I led. I led a statewide agency, statewide, against police brutality, against the police who were killing unarmed civilians. If that doesn't tell you I'm a leader, I don't know what does. I've led in the military as a captain, as a military officer, for over 10 years and one year in Afghanistan. I've led at the New York Brooklyn District Attorney's Office where I trained, supervised, and managed other prosecutors. You know I can lead, and you have to take leadership on day one because there are 340 attorneys, prosecutors in that office, but there are also another 300 investigators and support staff. If you don't know what you're doing, it's going to be very difficult to learn the job on you on your feet as you go along. And then what happens to our justice system while you're trying to... It suffers, exactly. Yes, sir. Uh, well, we have one thing in common, being for military. Oh, okay. Thank you for your service. Question. Um, I don't know if you remember about two, it's possible about two years now, a young man was killed in Brooklyn. Um, they said he was pointing some of the cops. You remember that incident? No, sorry. Like, um, a gentleman that was killed in Brooklyn, 
Um, Crown Heights. Yeah. That it said he was pointing uh, in, in something at the cops. Yes. Or the people. Yes. On oh, Utica. Yes. Yes. On yes. Utica. Yes. Well, that gentleman happened to be my Saeed. 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 Saeed is actually my cousin. Okay. Yeah. Oh, condolences. Sorry. My condolences to you. What I am curious about, shortly after the incident happened, all the recorders for every business on that strip mm. was taken from the were taken from them. That's yep. right. That's right. Every recorder, yes, the NVR system, yes. NVR systems, yes. every single one was taken away. Or oh, taken out by NYPD. NYPD. By, by by within, within minutes of it happening, it's, it's gone. there was because I when I when my family called me, they called me because they said, well, I would know how to retrieve the information yeah. that and what happened. Now, news media had it showing. Yeah. But when we went to all those delis and restaurants and bars and shops, they took off, took away probably like 40 DVRs, NVRs. And so I all, yeah. Yeah. And so I asked people, like, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm asking you personally, yeah. is there a buffer between when, like, I noticed something because I also am an installer. So something I sent to notice, what provision is there for private homeowners, business owners, that the cops can automatically just walk into your place and literally terrorize you for the, the, the video from your, your systems. Is there any law or anything in provision that ordinary, because sometimes I get calls in the middle of the night, the cops at my house, and I don't know how to do this, and I don't know how to do it, and they literally will harass you. Yeah. No ends. Oh, we know how to do it. And then people will tell me afterward, you know, I think like I'm being harassed because they will just pop up at my house in the middle of the day. Oh, can I get, oh, we need to, I think the camera was pointing there and we need to get. So my question is, as somebody in the political field, how does people protect themselves from that kind of history? Well, let me talk about Said Vassal because Said Vassal was a case that I investigated. Um, uh, with the New York State Attorney General's office. And what we found was that NYPD had not only taken, and, you, and it's, in, it's, it's actually in a public report that I, that I drafted, and not only did they take uh, the video uh, from all the establishments down Utica Avenue, they didn't show it to, you know, they didn't show it to, to, to the public. They only showed certain clips of certain cameras let, let me let me finish. Let me finish. And what they were doing was they were creating a narrative. So in order to create a narrative, what you had to do is we, you had to you had to take certain angles from certain cameras that fit the narrative. And if there were other angles and other views that didn't fit the narrative, you took those away. And they literally literally picked and chose who what videos to show. And one of the biggest criticisms that we made against the district attorney, uh, against the, the NYPD, was that you cannot manipulate information. If you're going to release information, you release all information. Do not pick and choose to create a narrative that fits your, you know, your purpose. You must, if you're going to release information, release everything, every angle. And we found additional angles in our investigation, and witnesses. And, and another thing that they didn't do is they didn't, wit they didn't get any witnesses. This was a homicide. I don't care if the person who did the shooting was a cop. It's a homicide, period. You should be investigating it. You should be identifying witnesses. If it were anybody else, if the, per if the person, the shooters, were one of us, you better believe they would be canvassing the area for witnesses. But the officers didn't do that. The detectives didn't do that. They didn't canvass. We, we, we identified three witnesses that the police, they had no idea. And all we had to do was look at the video. Because they were right on the video. You could, you could see them there. So why didn't you ask them what, what happened? The, the third thing that they did to Mr. Vassal that, that was horrible was they, turn, they, they, they released certain 911 tapes. But the 911 callers had called after the shooting. Had not seen anything and called after the shooting. And then they made it seem like those individuals called before the shooting and that that's what the, the officers were, were responding to, and they weren't. They were responding to one call, 
one call of a man holding an object. And based on a man holding an object, they responded the way they did. You know, and it's a difficult situation for a police officer. You have to step yourself out. You know, and, and I criticized them heavily, and I and I, I recommended that the attorney general criticize them heavily, and she did. But what also we had to recognize was that when the officers got that one call, they didn't ask the right questions. When the 911 operator picked up that call, they didn't ask the right questions. Like, what's going on? He's pointing at something. Why is he pointing? How is he acting? Because if they had asked the right questions, they would have identified him as somebody with mental illness. As somebody who was engaging in this activity, not because they were hurting somebody, but because they were mentally ill, emotionally ill. And that's what happened. You, they, they presumed that he was a threat, and then the police stepped onto the scene with the presumption that he's a threat, and they acted accordingly because they thought he was a threat. But they weren't acting on good information because the 911 quarter didn't do his job. They weren't acting on good information because the, the calls that came in, they weren't given all the calls that came in. And that was a huge mistake, and it cost Saeed Vassal his life. He didn't have to die that day, and it cost him his life. And this is why the district attorney has to be a check. Now, specifically to your question of how do you, a person protect themselves if a police officer comes in and demands the, the, the videotape, they don't have to consent to giving it over. They can hold on to it and say, you have to get a search warrant, you have to get some type of court order for me to give this over. And they can do that and, and, and retain it. And some, some of them actually did do that. There was a couple of angles that, that they were very, uh, let's say, you know, they didn't trust the police. So they were like, we don't have anything. But then when I, when I went there, they were like, we have something. When I went there personally and said, listen, we're just trying to find out the truth. They were like, let me, let me show you what I got. If they trust, and that's why it's so important that the police earn the trust of the community. If they trust you, they will help you. But if they, if they think that you're just going to twist the, the facts and, and not be truthful and try just to you know, cover something up, they're not going to cooperate. They don't want anything part of it. You know? And it takes somebody that, you know, a district attorney that changes the culture. But they can refuse to, to provide that information. take their systems down or position them elsewhere. Because when you have somebody badgering you like four times in a week or two weeks right. or five times in two weeks or like literally every weekend they're at your house. It becomes difficult to say no. Yeah, I've had people who like, you know, I was like, well, it's there for viewing purposes. Take the hard drive out, show them, open it and show them that there's no hard drive in there. Right, right. To not so be it's just fewer. Which is sad, which is sad because if, if, if they're able to get evidence of a crime, that's so important. But if you're not dealing with them fairly, if you're not being honest with them, if you don't earn the trust of the people, then they're going to do that. They're not going to help you. They're going to make it, it doesn't record because they don't want to cooperate with police. And just like when I was a young man, I didn't want to go to the police for anything. Same thing with business owners. They just don't want to cooperate. And that's, that's dangerous. Oh, I always tell people that if you see a police officer come to your house with one of this, what's that? What's that? it's a flash drive, oh. and he tells you he wants to retrieve data from your systems, tell him you'll get your own. Yeah, yeah, that's right. There's usually a software embedded on here. Your password it's and your IP address. And they don't need they don't need to get the, the, the written password from you. Once they go back to the precinct and they boot their system up and stick it in, you can change your password like twenty times. Uh, wow. Yes, ma'am. Thank you for your question. Um, I have a similar situation with him. You remember 2013, um, this guy in Manhattan, he get out of his car and then another guy just pulled up and shot him in his head. He was murdered right in broad daylight in 2013. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, oh, a road rage. It was a road rage incident or something like that. I don't even remember what it was, but then nobody, the guy just get back in his car and drove. But that was in Manhattan. But I live in Queens, and um, I think it was like about three months after the incident, I saw like six cops came to right. my house right. from Manhattan, um, all detectives. 
and they said, um, no Jack, from the car that the, the killer was driving, came over the bridge, came on my street that I live on, and they checked with the 133 precinct and see that I have 16 cameras. So I said, yes. So they said, they need my DVR. I said, no, you're not. Right. So they said, yes. I said, I have no problem for my cameras to solve a crime. Mm. But you would have to get a DVR and come back so I can put mine up and you could take this. I have no right. problem. The, image, the next thing I know, two days after I was served with a subpoena from the, the yeah, Manhattan district attorney um, stating that I refused to turn over. So I, I supposed to turn it over. Um, I think they gave me a month. The date that they gave me, that date that they needed would have been erased itself already because yeah. my camera only do four to five days. Okay. Most people do 30, my camera does 45. Right, right, right. And I spoke to the assistant district attorney from Manhattan. They gave me a number and I called. And I said, you know that cop is lying? He's yeah. lying. I said, I told him, go borrow one, go buy one, and DVR brought it back to me because I'm a caterer and I comes in late at night and I spent over $30,000 for this system mm -hmm. with brains. So this is for my safety coming in my house. I'm going to give you mine and then the next thing I know I'm killed and everybody, oh, so have $30,000 camera and she's dead in right. her own driveway? Right. I said, no. I said, furthermore, the day you were requesting me that I have to turn it over, it will erase itself already. Right. So what are you going to do it, now? It, it, I can get an attorney, I can get an attorney, or I can just wait it out and turn it over. But I said one reason. My brother, who speaks six different languages and was murdered in his law enforcement, that wasn't a nice day for my family, so I would not like right. another mother knowing that my camera could have solved her son's death, and I decided because of the lying cops, I decided not to. So I said then, I said to them, yes, you can come and get it, but bring me one. The district attorney decided they're gonna send me one, but I didn't want the one they sent me. I already get one, because I didn't trust it for no reason, as, as he was saying. So when the cops came, it was the same cops that tell the lie. I said, sir, do not pass my gate on coming. You're not allowed in my yard. Go over to 113 precinct and ask them. They know me pretty well. Ask them to come and do it. You, you're not alone here. Yeah. 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 And, that's, and that's why and you have to have a district attorney as a check. Yes, the district the attorney was very nice. And I you know, explained the reason that it would have been erased. And she said to me, you know, he said, thank you for doing that. Because, you know, we understand. I said, my brother was murdered. And, you know, my mother would not, I would not like anybody to go through because I have a camera in my room. So once Brinks and did that, they had to register it with the 113 precinct. Mm -hmm. So whenever anything, they come to me. So I said, okay. They brought, like they come in and they didn't know to work it. I know to work it to an extent, but they called on Long Island to, a, a, they called him the tech cop. And he came in, I'm telling you, sir, I didn't know that the system could have done. The system, when he went on with the equipment and he spinning around, there was the killer face. He turned the car around and they could see. So my camera was the camera that solved that murder all the way in Manhattan and I live in Queens. Wow. And that's great. Right. And I want to thank you for cooperating with law enforcement because that's what we need to solve crimes. But unfortunately, the approach that they used mm -hmm. they turned you off, turned you off. Yeah. Yeah. The approach and that they that used actually hurt them. I and said, no, I can stop you to the subpoena at the date, but that date, there will be nothing on there for that date wow. that you need. <laughs> but see, and that's why they have to remember that they have to treat everybody with respect. Right. And they have to understand and listen. Because what they could have done, because they have an entire unit dedicated to, to video, it's called Tyru. They could have had these professionals, who, that's all they do. Come in, take the video from your DVR, and leave your DVR the way it was. Mm -hmm. And then just you know take the images that they needed. But they wanted to make a point. And the point that they wanted to make was they wanted something, and they want to make you give it to them. Yeah, but they didn't know who they were. And exactly. Lot of people didn't know me, and they know, I grew up in the UN as a child. My sister traveled every president from Reagan until she retired six years ago. So, you know, 
I know if there's a problem, I'm calling my sister. They send me something. Oh, you cannot discuss this because it's ongoing. I said, mm, too bad. I'm giving you one that have immunity and double double security. So I call my sister. I said, Joyce, in case anything happens, the district attorney for my This is what's going on. And I, I'll tell you what should have happened in that case. When the police came back and they said, well, we have a person that has video that is not giving it to us. The district attorney should have said, why not? Why not? Mm -hmm. What What did you tell her? What did she tell you? What was going on? And they should have called. They should have called you before issuing a subpoena. Right. right. Because what purpose would have been to issue a subpoena and then get the video and then find out it's been erased because they waited yeah, so long? Yeah, waited so long. Rather they than doing that, they could have picked up the phone and said, "Listen, ma'am, these officers were at your house on this day. This is what they said. They you said to them, what's going on? How can I help? How can I facilitate this? this is a very important case." And that's how you treat that's how you treat people with respect, with dignity, and you listen to them and you find out how where's the common ground. But if it's just about I got the authority and you don't, and therefore you have to do what I say, it's not gonna work. So, it's gonna break down every time. So that's what should have happened, and that's the culture change that I'm talking about. The district attorney's office needs to be a check on the police. And when they hear something that doesn't sound right, they need to be the ones to say, wait a minute. Why are you saying why why doesn't this sound right? One of the one of the one of the cases that I, that I was very involved in at the Brooklyn DA's office was a case where we had three anti crime units rolling ro roving around in rogue anti crime units ro ro you know roving around in Brooklyn and they were setting people up and they were setting people up by doing this they they had an undercover a, a confidential informant they never registered and the confidential informant would arrange for individuals to come into Brooklyn on a, in a livery cab with a gun in the car. And they wow. did it four, five times, five separate cases. And every time that the same teams would come in and they would say the same things. We were watching a livery cab driver. He made a left turn, on an illegal, illegal left turn. He was watching a livery cab driver. He had a defective tail light. And I'm like, why are all these stories the same? We did an investigation. We found out they were all doing the same thing, and we had all taken out of the out of their precincts because they were doing the wrong thing. Because they were, but that's when you have to have somebody in in a position like mine, in a position like the district attorney's office, willing to ask those questions. What's going on here? Why does this, this doesn't this sound right? And then hold the police accountable and say this is what we need to do. You know that's why it's so important. Otherwise. If you're just gonna accept everything that they give you, you're never gonna ask those questions and you're never gonna hold them accountable for doing the wrong thing. But another thing that I need you, you know, wanna know what you're gonna do is the cash bill situation. Yes, absolutely. Where, you know, with, you know, parents who cannot afford that, and I've noticed, you know, I have two friends in the situation before, that had to put on my property for his son. Because I know where to find him, so right. I know he's not gonna run. Right. You know, but what happened to parents who can You know, these were like misdemeanors. And you have situations where people actually die in incarceration because they can afford a hundred dollars bail. You know, five hundred dollars bail, where you know most people, if you have a job, you're able to do that. So it becomes a two-tier system, a system with people with money, and a system with people without. And the people without have to sit in jail and, and for, for months. You know, you have like the Khalif Browder case where he stood in jail for three years because he couldn't afford the bail. That's the only reason he stood in jail for that long. Now, and he ended up committing suicide because of the abuse that he suffered in jail. Now, I'm going to end cash bail. I'm going to end cash bail because I strongly believe you should not be in jail simply because you cannot afford to buy your freedom. That's not justice. That's that's injustice. That's punishing individuals for being poor. Absolutely, for all offenses. All offenses. It doesn't matter, matter what the offense. Now, what does that mean? Does that mean that everybody gets to, 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 you know, you kill somebody, you get to walk the streets? No. Because if you're a threat to society, if you're a threat to the public, there's a system called remand where you will be held uh, until pending trial. But it's not because you can't afford $500. It's not because you can't take money out of your pocket and pay a bail. It's because you've, you've, you're have you've a risk to public safety. You're a demonstrated risk to public safety because of what you've done, because of the history you have. 
You know, those are the, those are the situ- situations where you have to, you know, protect the public. But when it's for the vast majority of the cases, the nonviolent drug cases, the 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 even some of the um, violent um, possession cases where it's a possession of a firearm. That person should be free because the system that we operate under is that you're innocent until proven guilty. If that's the system we operate under, why are we holding people in jail when they're innocent? Because that's right. They're innocent until proven guilty. guilty. Yes, Yes, sir. sir. Talking about that, you can put a cap on that. Say if it's over a certain amount, it is understood that you did something real wrong, something real bad. You have to stay in jail. But say if it's under, and then on top of it, the person cannot afford. Right, and and the law allows for different other me- other mechanisms for other than cash bail. The law actually allows for you to have uh, secured, unsecured, and uh, secured, unsecured, and partially secured appearance bonds. Uh, unsecured appearance bonds will be like your wife or your husband or your father or your employer comes in and says, "Hey, I know them. I know where they live. They're going to come back to court." Because the only purpose for bail or appearance bonds is to make sure you come back to court. It's not punishment. It's not so you haven't been convicted of a crime. How could they punish you? So it's just to make sure you come back to court. And in an unsecured appearance bonds, you basically allow somebody to 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 have their liberty pending the case uh, on the on the voucher or on the vo- on the word of somebody who knows them. A partially secured bond, you put some type of personal property of value. So you're not gonna you gonna lose that personal property. Fully secured, you put you use your your, your real property. You know, so it goes up depending on your risk factor, how much of a risk. And this is why it's so important for the district attorney to have experience. Because if you've been doing this for 18 years, you know who's the risk. You know who's the one that, that got made a mistake and got caught up in the criminal justice system versus the person, the career criminal, who is a risk to the public. And you have to make sure that the public is protected from them. If you don't have that experience, if you can't gauge that level of threat and, and flight, then the issue, the, the problem is who you're gonna rely on, and you and you you have to remember you can't rely on them hiring other people, you can't rely on them hiring other people. You're voting them into office. They should know how to do the job. Yeah. Um, I have a question. Well, actually, um, I was hoping if you do get in office, could you uh put a check on that? Um, is a certain charge that you get, like say the RR. Our, our charge? Yeah, no, that's not a charge. That's released on your own reconnaissance. Right, that's, right. That's, you, you're, you're free to go until the, yeah, the but case with, is uh, But with that also, because I got that one time and I got a charge stuck on me that kind of like messed up my whole rap sheet right now. Right, right, right. Right? So it's like a trick to it. So, you know what I mean? With, with that, I mean, if you do get in the office, could you like make sure it go? You know, straight or you know, as as uh, according to your you know your your yourself, your, right. your your script. Right. You know what I mean? So if they do give it to you, you know what I mean? It's it's not like they just trying to pin a charge on you, send you home, and then you know what I mean? Your whole record is messed up. The, the, the issue with ROR is when you don't return, what do they do? And Queens, what it does is it automatically indicts you for bail jumping. Doesn't ask why you didn't show up. Doesn't ask to try to find out what the circumstances are for failing to appear. They automatically charge you. And then, let's say the original case is dismissed, they still have this charge because you've missed the a court date. And then, they, and the way they approach it is, you, they, for that charge, you have to plead guilty and it's a minimum of six months jail. No negotiation. Sit up, plead to the charge in six months jail. That's not justice. That's not justice. And those policies have to end because those policies are not there to do justice. Those policies are there to hurt people. And that's why we have to, that's why we can't, we have to look at the circumstances. We have to look at the individual. What's going on in their life? Why are they doing this? Why did they miss court? Why are they committing crime? What's the issue? Maybe they're a drug addict and and they had a relapse, right? Maybe they have mental illness. There's circumstances that are there that you need to know before you punish an individual for doing something wrong. Because you have to find out the bigger picture. Yes, ma'am. On the same part of expunging of records, um, this teacher, she teaches in Brooklyn. She lives in Queens. One day, a 13-year-old assaulted her badly. When I mean badly, he pushed his hand underneath her. He pushed his hand in her, in her, in her chest. And she pushes, eased him off. And um, 
only to come home when she came home the evening. The police came and arrested her to say that she assaulted her child. Yes. And um, the case went on for a good while. And she won the case. She didn't, she didn't get salary. She got nothing. She won the case about two or three years ago. And even now, her record is not expunged. And I mean to say it is so ridiculous because you was not guilty, the judge said to the, 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 the DA. As a matter of fact, this woman should not be arrested because she did nothing. And even now, a record is not expunged. You know, my wife is a criminal defense attorney, and she comes home every day with a different story about how something like this happens, where people get caught up in the criminal justice system for nonsense, and the DA's office takes a very hard law and order. We don't care what your circumstances are. We don't care what the story is. All we care about is the police brought us a case, and now we're prosecuting you. That's it. And that's not, that's not justice. And that's what I'm telling you. You have to look at the circumstances. You know, you have to talk with, you know, one of the things that, that we've done in other jurisdictions, like in the U.S. Attorney's Office and in the Brooklyn District Attorney's Office, we actually work with defense counsels. We don't think the defense counsel is the enemy. We think the defense counsel is going to help us understand what's going on because they're the ones talking to the client. They're the ones sharing with the client, listen, what happened that day? What is it that, that, that caused you to do this? What, what was going on here? And they share that with the, def with, the, with the prosecutor. But if you don't have that sharing of information, the system doesn't work. And in, in Queens, they refuse to share information. They will hold on to information. The prosecutors will not give over information to defense counsels until right before trial. And then they dump it on the, on the defense counsel that they're not prepared to, to, to do the trial. And they get convictions turned over for that. So it's, you're not sharing information. And when you don't share information, you're not doing justice. Because in that case, what should have happened is the defense counsel and the district attorney should have had an, a, a strong conversation of why are we charging this person? What are the circumstances behind them? What, what, what happened that day? What, what, what led up to this? What happened the day before? Because if she's a teacher. I have to venture to, to guess she has no criminal history. So why would a person who has a job, who has a pension, who, is, who, who has education, risk it all? That's the question you have to ask yourself as a DA. What's going on here? And then talk with the defense counsel and find out what's going on here. Because that case should have been dismissed. Once you found out that she was being assaulted herself and responding to the assault, that should have been like, wait a minute, let's do the right thing here. Let's do justice, and justice in that case was not to press charges against a woman. Not to press charges against a woman. And, you know, cases like this are brought to me by my wife all the time where the DA just doesn't want to listen. They don't want to know. They don't care. And all they care about is getting a conviction. And, and it can't be that. It, and it's, I'm sorry, it's yeah. where the judge said, she should not be here, and if you bring her back here, you are going to be in problems with me. Right. And that's where... It stopped, but she still she goes back. Her, her case is not the, the, the thing is that they fudge. So I want to know what yeah, would she, she do? What what she what, what what she can do? If, uh, I'll give my wife an opportunity to talk, but she's a criminal defense attorney. She does this all the time with her clients. That that she knows they didn't do anything. The, the DA dismisses the case, but then there's you have an arrest that keeps popping up. So I'll let her speak. So what I, what I wanted to say is that a lot of times, even when you get arrested and your case is dismissed and you stand before a judge and the judge says, okay, your case is dismissed and sealed, guess what? Your fingerprints are out there in the ether somewhere. So when somebody goes to do a fingerprint check and a background check, yes. guess what pops up? Your fingerprints. So one thing that I always do for my clients and that if you want to speak to me afterwards, I, I will absolutely speak to you about your friend, is once a case is dismissed and sealed, I don't rely on the judge saying it's dismissed and sealed because when you are arrested and they fingerprint you, those fingerprints go to Albany, to 1PP, to Police Plaza, and to... Um, uh, I forgot where they go to three places and that's where they're kept and so after a case is dismissed and sealed we have to go to that extra step to send letters to all three places to say destroy them now mm. because otherwise when you apply for a job or something else it pops up yeah. so talk to me afterwards okay,
Yeah. And then tell them about my mini campaign with the Queen's DA's office. I sincerely hope you get elected because I know it's, you know, it's time for reform, it's time for change, and right. I feel like a lot of people in this room feel the same way. Yes. My Our question is, is what, what can we all do in the elections in within six days to yeah. get you elected? Because I think that's, that's so important. That's probably one of the most important things, is getting that you is elected. So important. Because, yeah, 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 that's yeah. so important. And, and what it is, is getting, getting the word out. Getting my name out. We got we got radio stations. We got TV news, uh, print. We got you know, you know on TV news. We we have uh, online um, you know stations. And I and I, I'm open to speaking to any group, any congregation, any tenant association, any block association. I don't care what it is. Any church. I've been to many many churches already, speaking to them, and they understand that I, they get it. They get that the change needs to happen, and they get that I'm the person, the right person to make that change happen because of where I come from, because of what I know, because of the professional experience I have. And they know, they understand that. So that's what we have to do. We have to get the name, the message out, and you know, get you know as many people to, to your friends to the polls, your neighbors to the polls, your, you know, your, your family to the polls, and say you have to vote. This is a once in a lifetime opportunity. I agree. This is a yeah. once in a lifetime opportunity. All right, and citizens, naturalized citizens, they're lazy. They don't get out and vote in these elections. They think the presidential election yeah. is the only true one until they're in a situation to see they should have done you know, these elections Absolutely. coming up. So we have to get you on the Caribbean radio, yeah. which a lot of us in here, like myself, yeah. know how to do that very well, and have you elected, because Melinda Kent, no, she's not for us. Oh, we she's have to, we have to. Yeah. I know this gentleman uh, for, for a while, and I studied his background, and I also was following Queen's District Attorney Richard Brown. And his background. Mr. Niev has admitted there is a two types of prosecution. One is soft prosecution and another is hardcore prosecution. In South Jamaica area, there is a couple of, of our colored people gunned down by police. Mm -hmm. How many of the police officers got convicted? Mm -hmm. Zero. Inside the Queen's District Attorney's Office, this says do the soft prosecution. What does that mean? Mm -hmm. Soft prosecution, let them go. <laughs> so all the police officers went back to their position and working. Another thing I want to mention, Richard Brown didn't care about the citizen or residents of Queens County. Do you know why? Because he himself was not the residents of Queens County. He is living in Westchester County for the last 17 years. Oh. How come no one is saying anything? Just that many the kids. How come he was the residence of Westchester County? Never lived in Queens County for the last 17 years. Number two. Number three, I'll share one sad story. I myself got arrested in 2007. One congressman approached Richard Brown and says, Dick, you are sending one innocent man to prison. What the hell are you doing? Richard Brown responded, Ben, do you think your client is the only innocent goes to prison? Oh, oh, wow. This is the conversation took place at the same synagogue that Richard Brown used to go. And guess what? Melinda Cards cut a deal behind the closed door that she's going to keep each and every single goons and Eastern District attorneys, Buruchik, at their chair so that she get elected. Listen, this gentleman, I'm not just supporting him because he is a smart guy, he looks good, he's one of our own. I'll tell you this one thing. I'll, I'll tell you one thing. At least I'm sure my brother lives in Queens Villas. Right. Yeah. He's my neighbor. Yeah. He's my neighbor. He's my color. He's our color. Human color. Number three, he's real. A military prosecutor. He went to Afghanistan. He set up a law. He knows how to manage people. And a captain? He guess what? A captain is a commander of a platoon, a regiment. So he has life experience to lead three, four hundred people. 
Four, he has the courage. He's not loud like me, but guess what? <laughs> guess what? When things is bad, he can challenge. My brother has the courage to persecute police officer. My brother has the courage to persecute correction officer. How many candidates we have? No one. Nobody. And another thing, last thing, I'm begging you. Even if you decide that you're going to vote for my brother Jose Nieves, that's not enough. Talk to your brother. Talk to your children who has Facebook access, social media access. Yeah. Talk to your brother or friend who is running a te television show, as I do one. I, I'm trying my best to put him everywhere. Talk to the neighbor that, hey, vote for Jose Nieves. He's one of our own. Out of seven candidates, he's the only candidate, man of color, who cares about people. I'm from Bangladesh, by the way. His brother from other mother. I think he can serve his community way better than anyone. Another thing is, my girlfriend, since we were teenagers, her husband was brutally murdered the 13th of April on Guybrook Boulevard. And he leave to get food for the kids, he never come back. And she was already on a cruise for her birthday. Mm -hmm. So, up until now, they're not. When a black man is killed in these neighborhoods, the police don't care. Nope. I see when that, that um, the, what they call him over in Staten Island, when he got killed. No, no, no. The, the mafia, the mafia guy. Ah. That, oh, and, yes. Yes, and they have police around the clock at his house. That's what I'm saying. But now we're tired of calling the cops to see who is the investigating officer. Um, 101, the one down there in Mary. No, not 113. 103. Yes. And we can't get him. They said he's on vacation. He's not. Like they just don't care because it's a black man got killed. So what we supposed to do about these things? That means if we're not white, police really not on top of things. They just figure, well, it's a black guy, it must be in drugs or something, you know? Well, they said the same thing yeah. when Sean Bell got killed. Yeah. Sean yeah. Bell. Yeah. That's what they said. Yeah. You know, and, and it can't be a two tier system. You can't have uh, uh, two societies in Queens where, you know, one society that gets the benefit of law enforcement and gets the benefit of justice and gets the benefit of their rights, and another society that doesn't. Right, that gets targeted for over policing, that doesn't get respected by the law enforcement, it doesn't get treated with respect or, or dignity when they get into trouble or anything like that, or get, and gets over policed. We can't have that. We can't have that. But it takes the chief law enforcement officer to say that. If he says that and says this is not going to happen again, this is not how we do business in Queens, then you have a change. But if you have somebody who's just scared. Who's not gonna go? Who's gonna go along to get along? Who's not gonna stand up for the, the communities of color? Who's not gonna stand up for people's justice and people's rights? Then it's never gonna change. It's never gonna change. That's why you have to elect somebody who has that experience, who's gonna do that job and do it right. Because I can stand up to the chief of police because I've done it before. I could stand up to, to to individuals. I've I've i prosecuted generals in the army. It didn't matter what their rank was. When you did something wrong, when you're not doing justice, when you're doing the wrong thing, when you're abusing your authority, you need to be held accountable. And it really is so important that, that we, we, we understand that because you know we can't have discrimination anymore in the system. And we have to be able to have somebody in, in power to say that. You know, empowered to say that. You know, you, you, it's it's amazing how you have individuals in law enforcement that refuse to accept that they're white racist organizations that we have to investigate. Just like we investigate, you know, gangs. Just like we investigate criminal uh, enterprises. Just like we investigate terrorists. Because there are people out there that are hell bent on hurting other people because of who they pray to, because of where they come from because of how they look and who they love. And if, we, if we're not gonna say that and say, look, they're white supremacists in Queens that we need to crack down on, what, what do we, they'll, no, they'll never be brought to justice. They'll never be held accountable. But it takes somebody from our community to do that.
So we will come out with it. Let me say words, okay? You guys listen very carefully. I'm one of the person that I've been fighting for what he's fighting for for years in the Queen. I was the only person that ever in 37 years? 37 years, right? Yeah. 37 years or against D.A. Brown. I was the only person that did that. And uh, when I did my signatures, I found over 8,000 signatures. They give an answer, I only have 2,300 signatures. From all the signatures I get in Queens, not Brooklyn, not Bronx, in Queens. They said, I need 4,000 signatures. And I only needed two, because I'm a black man. They did that. Wow. So let me say this to, you, this to you, my friends and family. This room can elect that young man. Well, you know what we gotta do? It's just a little of hard work. Call your friends, mm -hmm. tell your friends, just tell your friends. Mm -hmm. We need reform. We need it to be. This is it needs to be changed. It's dirty. It's corrupted. And not to say this. This man lived upstate for how many years, right? Yep. And you want to learn one more thing? Queens County is run by three white men: Sweeney, Rachel, and Bowles. She's right. Okay. I know. I know. All Sweeney, stuff. Rachel, and Bowles. I know all run of them. New York, run Queens. Okay. And they live in Suffolk County, okay? Yes. Yeah. Wow. Yes. These are the things we go through. So I've only given you guys the experience in that from what yeah. I've been through in this Queen's political corruption. We tonight can elect this man. The way you, it's the passion right now, my friends. You have to get on the phones. Make some phone calls, and when you make a phone call, to say, send ten more, please. Yes. Yeah. It can happen. Yeah. yeah. Okay. But we have to be serious and want this change, mm -hmm. because there were seven years. You know, most black people in the jail on the DA yep. Brown. Mm -hmm. He won the last debate. Yeah. He was the better one yeah. in the last debate. Yeah. As a matter of fact, most of the yeah. forum, my brother won. Hey, let me, let me say my friend. Most of the forum. You see, you see, when you guys don't feel the pain, you don't know, you don't know what it is. I feel the pain, man. Yeah. I feel the pain. When I went against Cats in 11, I came in third. Not the only person was which one. You have Cats, Valone, Avella, and myself. I was the only was the I came in third. Very well. Who are you? Four. What? Four. What is your name? Everly Brown. Brown? From Queens. Queens. Yeah. Yeah. Brown. And you're in politics in Queens also. Yes, yeah, big part of this. You just been in so to know who you are. Huh? It's all good. So, you, so, you know, what I'm going to say tonight, my friends, please, get on the phone, make some phone calls, send some email, send some texts. Let's give Queens County Democratic Party a shot on your mind, a shot on the, a shot because they deserve a shot, right? They deserve right on a shot. Cats cannot. And all the information, they, they know she's not good for this year, but they still but, push her in. But, uh, but, but, assembly people that we put in office, yes. yep. they're packing her, which yes. I called a lot of them all week. I said, what's going on? Sweetheart, that's the game they play. You can't change. I see a lot of us out there, we have been cotton balls. We got no guts. Mm -hmm. And that's what they don't have. Everyone in they know when, when I come, I'm coming for the neck, not for the foot. <laughs> they know when I when I go out of the neck, not for the foot. So, so I'm here today to support this man right here. I'm asking you, please, please, this is not about neighbors, it's about our community. Yeah. <laughs> it's about the black brothers and yeah. black sisters. Yeah. Let Nevis the next Queen's Scripture. Yes. Wow. yes. Wow. Wow. And just to tell you that, they, they tried the same thing with me. They challenged my signatures. I collected over almost 10,000 signatures. I only needed four. And I collected almost 10,000 signatures, and they challenged my signatures. Wow.
and they try to knock me off the ballot and they weren't successful. But that's the games they play. The games they play. For the last 28 years. That's the games they play. And this, they want this to be a selection, not an election. They want to get to choose. And that's why you have to prove them wrong. What's your name, Nina? Yeah. Malik. I didn't even know. I said, well, what did you just say? You didn't know Nina. She's on that organization. Yes, okay. yes. You know, I'm like talking to the TV. I said, oh my God, I can't believe her. She looks so stupid just saying that. You and, and she didn't know the law. And she just didn't know the law. If she got a legal question, she didn't know the law. Well, and I think that, that was She's it. an attorney, never pulls her feet, either in civil court or criminal court. Right. She has a law license. Never use that license in the court of law. Mm -hmm. But she's running for Queen's Deal. Right. She used it at right. Buildings Department. Yeah, and guess what? <laughs> this gentleman cited Sweeney, Joe Crowley, and one of our brother now. Yeah. The shoving million duckers into our throat says yeah. you have to, you have to, you have to, you have to take it. Yeah, and it doesn't matter if she's qualified. It doesn't matter if she she cares about Southeast Queens. It doesn't matter if she cares about our community. Yeah. You will have to take her because mm -hmm. we said that's who she is. I cannot believe at the debate she says, I'm going to uh, create a law, this, this, this. She didn't realize that she's running for district attorney, not a legislator. I don't know how stupid that person can be. <laughs> she was, she was she's running for yeah, Queen's yeah. DA. She says she's, she's going to invent the law. How? <laughs> Mr. Nieves, does the district attorney have any power to invent the law? Listen, all the politicians that are running, ask yourself why they run. They're running because they're term limited. Yeah, they need a job. I hope yeah. you'll crush that's her tomorrow. What, that's why they're running. I'm going to be there tomorrow. I'm hoping for you to crush her tomorrow. Uh, uh, my brother is what I got to do. But again, I'm going to be there tomorrow. My brother is too gentle. But again, I'm not saying that much because my brother Barack Obama was gentle too. He was not gentle. Tell your friends to vote. Please get, you know, call me. Get you have to. You, I, my wife can give you my card. I'll go anywhere. I spoke to any group, any church, any organization. It's about getting the word out. It's about telling people how important it is. Once in a lifetime opportunity for you to change the criminal justice system, protect our kids, try to protect our community, and do the right thing. And let's get. Let's make it happen. Let's make it happen. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. You still have food, right? Yes. yes. <laughs> don't be shy. Don't be shy. Have you come to the food? I just want to come in there and Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Yes, so can you introduce yourself to the audience? Hi, my name is Jose Nieves, and I'm running for Queens County District Attorney. I, for the last 20 years, I've lived in Southeast Queens with my wife and two kids, but I grew up in East New York, Brooklyn, one of the toughest neighborhoods in the city, where I saw violent crime on the streets. So I know why public safety is so important, because how violent crime tears apart the families and communities that, have, with that, that I've seen growing up. And I've also been subjected to the racial discrimination in our system, because I've been stopped by the police for no other reason than because of the color of my skin and because I'm a Latino growing up in a high crime area. So I understand the criminal justice system not only as an attorney, but as somebody who's lived in a neighborhood that was uh, you know, really over-policed and discriminated against by the criminal justice system. And that's why I became an attorney. And I went on to Brooklyn Law School to, become, uh, to get my JD, and then St. John's University for my, master, well, my undergraduate in criminal justice degree. And then I became a district attorney, a district attorney in Brooklyn. And I served for 11 years as a district attorney in Brooklyn where I prosecuted violent crime. And I also made sure that individuals who were caught up in the, middle, in the criminal justice system were given an opportunity to be uh, set their, their, their life straight, to turn their life around. 
And the last position I had was a uh, deputy chief of the New York State Attorney General's Office, where I served as uh, the deputy chief as the Special Investigations and Prosecutions Unit. And my responsibility was to investigate and prosecute police officers who kill unarmed civilians. So I, I have a long history. I have an 18-year career as a prosecutor, a progressive prosecutor. And I've been holding people accountable, but not just people accountable. I've been holding the criminal justice system accountable by prosecuting police officers who abuse their authority and cause the death of unarmed civilians. And that's what I bring to this race for district attorney. Anyone who wants to support my campaign can go on to the website at Nieves for Queens DA. That's Nieves, N-I-E-V-E-S, 4 F-O-R, Queens, Q-U-E-N-E-E-N-S, D-A, at uh, Gmail. They can email me at Gmail or they can go to NievesforQueensDA.com and that's where they can get all my social media. I have Facebook, Instagram, YouTube, and, and also uh, the, the, the other uh, Twitter. That's also Twitter.